come from seven generations on Maui, born and raised, um, went away to school, came back, and ran for office at 22 years old. And um, been in the legislature for three years now and uh, going on to my third term. Excellent. So what position in, you, in the legislature? Where, where are you? So I'm in the House of Representatives for the mm -hmm. state, uh, representing Kihei, Wailea, and Makena, so the whole south side of Maui. And what made you want to go into politics? I'm an activist turned advocate turned politician. Kind of went over to the dark side, if you ask a younger me. <laughs> but, um, you know, I was growing up here. My father, we were in upcountry Maui. He would drive us to the beach uh, every Sunday after church in Kamaole. And he would point up on the mountains and be like, look, within your lifetime, this is all going to be developed. And, um, you know, when he, he passed away when I was about 12 years old, and I was, um, you know, I, I, I thought, how, not only is what he's saying coming true, but it wasn't the kind of homes that, you know, my brother and I could live in. It was 4,000 luxury condominiums that popped up in uh, like two or three years. So, you know, I asked myself, what could I do about this? So, you know, started off, you know, tying yourself to a tree, sitting in front of tractors, and you said, maybe instead of sitting in front of a tractor, I can sit on a board. Maybe I'll be more effective that way. You know, I go to um, college, um, you know, ran for student government and a few other things, really got the bug and said, um, then when I was in grad school in DC, I seen a Tea Party guy get elected on my home island. I'm like, this is crazy. This is the opposite of the values I grew up with. So I decided now's the time to run. So can you tell us how you got started in being active in the GMO and pesticide arena? One thing that's really frustrating to me as, you know, as somebody who, took, who takes science very seriously is this idea that being more precautionary about the proliferation of GMOs um, is anti-science. That's, that's crazy. When people are asking for more studies and you're inhibiting those studies, that's a slap in the face to science. Mm -hmm. Science means you know, your studies need to be um, replicable and repeated and you always want to, it's scaffolds, right? Each study comes off of each other. So when you try to stifle that, that's anti-science. <laughs> to say we don't need any more studies, it's, and you are anti-science is so ironic and just absurd to me. Yeah, and, and science means to question. So if we're questioning the safety of a product, uh, that is actually pro-science. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. To use science as a means to inhibit further scientific investigation is a slap in the face to science. Yeah, and to the people who want safety. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When you're driving your kid to school in Kihei and like adjacent to their school are these people in what looks like hazmat suits spraying things, you can't help but be nervous. You know, you can't help but raise questions. And I think it's very unfair for the industry to, um, you know, call these people fear mongers when they're like, their kid is right next to that. You know, it's like you, you can't blame them. And all, all, all I'm asking for is reasonable regulations. And if you're going to say no to buffer zones uh, for your pesticides around schools, which we had a bill for, if you're going to say no to labeling your own products like you're afraid of it, and if you're going to spend millions of dollars fighting an initiative that asks for just studies of any new crops, then you're probably hiding something. As much as they like to say there's um, you know, hysteria on one side, there's definitely overconfidence and fear mongering on um, the other side as well. And it's up to politicians uh, and legislators to try to figure out how to um, bring people to the table and have solutions that are fair. The industry has been unwilling to budge on even the simplest request. Show us, tell us what you're spraying and keep it away from schools and hospitals. And they say absolutely not. Come on, that's reasonable. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is, is that it's not only their products and their practices which people are against, it's now their reaction to their behavior on your request. So their own actions are making the public more wary of them and more suspicious and less trusting. Yeah, so we had the GMO moratorium um, initiative last year. Mm -hmm. My stepfather, he's a big corporate like science guy, right? He works for Boeing, he's a manager there. Mm -hmm. Real close to Monsanto, he's, he's friends with a lot of them. And he was gonna vote no, but after the financial disclosure came out, and he's like, dude, these guys are spending six, eight million dollars. Boeing would never do that. 
unless they're trying to hide something. Mm. Right. right. It doesn't make sense to spend that much money because that's a cut from your profits unless you're, you gain more by hiding something. So um, I think with just more transparency and some compromise, they could at least see more progress on their end for their own agenda. I came with the idea that big ele elections should be about big ideas, not big bank accounts or big checks or big donors. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I figured if I met enough people and listen that I could get elected. But I work from 4 a.m. to noon, and then after that I just knock on doors until sunset, um, wow. campaigning, and doing that eight hours a day, you knock on about 100 doors, um, it's exhausting, but it works, because even if they don't agree with you, they can't say you're not working hard, they can't say you're not listening. Um, the, a lot of the concerns I heard was, you know, cane burning, um, and GMOs were always in the forefront. So I said, you know, this is what the people care about, and it's what I'm gonna care about. And because I didn't have um, any allegiances mm -hmm. uh, to these people that wrote me checks because I didn't raise much money, mm -hmm. um, you know, those people became my bosses. You went door to door, you, you put in the time, you listened. Was there a movement of native support? There's a problem that's not just a Hawaii problem, but it's in indigenous populations across the world where we become so disenfranchised that we don't just hate the players, we hate the game. We completely don't believe in the system. And that's the case for a lot of Native Hawaiians today where less than 10% estimated come out and vote. So the idea that you know, it was the Native population that propelled me to victory is probably false. But the idea that they're well connected and their families have influence and they help get the word out and really create a grassroots movement that ultimately permeated among the voting base, um, yeah, there's probably some validity there. Uh, Native Hawaiians tend to be the only indigenous group in the United States that's not politically recognized in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And Hawaiians are split on what that means now. Some s support um, federal recognition and build a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. Others don't, and they're so disenfranchised. So we're having a private election now to um, convene delegates to decide if we want to pursue that, if we want to form what our government's going to look like once it's formed. And a lot of people are deciding not to vote on this election because um, they think the process is flawed and they don't want to settle for anything less than full independence or the restoration of the Hawaiian kingdom. I get it, you know, we were, our queen was illegally overthrown and you know, we need to make right. In the meantime, there's programs like the Hawaiian homelands, um, Kamehameha schools, and you know, issues like Mauna Kea, issues like um, the EMI, the water rights for Kalo farmers, those would not be issues if we had a nation-to-nation relationship, one, or if we just voted Hawaiians into state office. I get so lonely. There's a vote earlier this session about demilitarization, and I was the only one out of 81 electeds who spoke up that supported the reduction of troops on Oahu. That's crazy to me. It makes common sense. You're freeing up the economy, you're, you're providing more affordable housing, mm -hmm. and you, you have a chance to recover this EPA Superfund sites, which are their bases. But, um, you know, unfortunately, that's not the way that the American politicians tend to look at these issues. If Hawaiians voted just with the values that we tend to hold, um, the people we elect, whether or not they are Kanaka, um, they'll be a lot more sympathetic to our causes. So we're really shooting ourselves in the foot and creating a self-fulfilling prophecy that um, Politicians aren't listening when we don't vote. Voting mm -hmm. is our kuleana. My husband says that we need to stop appealing to the people in power and be the people in power. And that's what you're calling on the Native, Native Hawaiians to do, is to be the people in power, then run for office, right? And, and, and to be people alongside you voting for what's right for the, the Native population. A lot of people ask me why my colleagues don't support um, the things that we believe in. Um, you know organic farming, local food production, 100% renewable future for Hawaii, um, being a lot more uh, precautionary about the proliferation of GMOs. And why are we such a minority? Well, it's kind of split. Like, look at the GMO moratorium on Maui, how close it was. So t to just focus on that issue is very difficult. Look at Gary, who, who we just talked to. His election was really close, but if you, have a broader message and hold on to principles and translate that to other issues, then people aren't gonna just write you off as the pro-GMO or anti-GMO person. Mm -hmm. They're gonna see you as someone they can relate to on multiple levels. And I think that's what a lot of politicians tend to um, make the mistake of getting into. They tend to pigeonhole themselves into this uh, anti-GMO mm -hmm. um, persona, which 
you know, we're, no human being is that simple. Right. Yeah. And then there's, there's many other issues. And there's a movement to have Hawaii be its own independent kingdom again. And so that is up for consideration. Is that true? There's two sides to it. There's the political recognition side, and mm -hmm. then there's the nation building um, independence side, and they're two separate and distinct issues. But the idea of home rule is no new one for you know, Native Hawaiians. We had our islands divided up by mokus and by ahupua'as, and they're all self-sufficient. And you know, it's just a matter of bartering to your neighbor if you ever needed something more. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible that today we're so reliant on imports, like 90% of our food is imported, that if our ports were to shut down on Maui, we'd last like less than two days, a day and a half. On, in contrast, our ancestors hundreds and hundreds of years ago with three or four times the population lasted for centuries on their own with no imports. And I think it's moving back to the basics of local food production and um, home rule that's really gonna get us um, to where we want, need to go. So you learn the lessons from your kupuna. You know, we're always taught like, that we inherit the land from our, from our ancestors. I am more look at it through a lens of this ancient proverb that we don't inherit the land from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. Mm -hmm. So when we decide to, you know, I could buy dinner right now at McDonald's and save a bunch of money, but you know, maybe if I um, you know, eat, eat something else that's more sustainable, um, it's a sacrifice I have to make, but because I, I look to my, to my ancestors and recognize the sacrifices they made for me to bring me to where I am, it makes my sacrifices make sense now because you know, we're borrowing this aina from our grandchildren. Wow. Being here in Hawaii and speaking to people like you reminds me that with your culture comes a tremendous amount of respect. Respect for your ancestors, respect for the earth, respect for the future. And that's something that I see is sorely missing in a fast-paced um, uh, American culture where I call it the disease of ease. We want everything fast, tasty, hot, cheap, you know, easy. And, um, and it really diminishes the amount of respect that we have, not only for ourselves, but for our future. And, so I appreciate that you, you bring that up and you, you make it that this is, this is a choice that we make, not only for ourselves, but for the future. So what would you say to other young people who are considering being politicians? There was this time where any young person that wanted to run, when I first got elected, I was all for, and I was gonna give them a bunch of advice. But you know, there's certain buttons you press in a certain order and you're gonna win. But you can be new pain on old ideas, you know, as a young person. I'd rather mm -hmm. people come in with a new outlook on things um, in a way that uh, will actually make a difference for our generation. And, you know, anyone under 30, we're, we might be the first generation. We're, we're actually a lot worse off than the previous generation. Mm -hmm. This is in the history of our nation. And it's up to us to really get back to basics and recognize that this pace we're on, this track we're on, is unsustainable, and we need to um, focus on you know, renewable f uh, fuels and energy. Um, we need to focus on local food production, uh, caring for our aina in a reciprocal manner, or respect the land just as much as, um, that we need it just as much as it needs us, and getting back to those bases, I think, will we'll do it. If your opponent raises twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 more than you, knock on 3,000 more doors. If your opponent has some huge media event and this you know, has Ekolu playing and all the big wigs from all the big industries on Maui, yeah, they look like a big shot, but while they're doing that, you just met 200 voters knocking on doors. <laughs> like, you're gonna win. Mm -hmm. And I just, I need to hammer that into like, young people who think that you know, their sign waving, their protests aren't making a difference. Consider running for office, knock on doors, work hard and listen. And if you're coming from um, a place of your own values and not trying to disguise it, people will recognize it. Mm -hmm. The votes will come and then money will come. Everything you know, will work out. I wish every politician was like you. You're just brilliant. You're so eloquent and you're so authentic and you're so real and I'm just, you made my trip. Because you just give me so much inspiration and like hope that something's going to change here because we need it to change. We, like the Americans, are just so overwhelmed with despair that nothing's going to change. And because it's all coming from here, we're like, we're begging you guys to do something about this. It's coming out of here and we can't, it's like the spigot opened and we can't stop it. We're too far away. 
So when I meet somebody like you, I'm just so grateful that, that you exist and that you're taking a stand and you're being courageous. No, thank you for coming here. We need yeah. to get our message out. We're ground zero. And, yes, this is, you know. this is ground zero for GMOs. And the fact that you are doing something about it means the world to the world. <laughs> Literally, thank you so much. Thank you.